can go ahead and get started. Um, how's, everybody, how's everyone been? How are your spring breaks? Too short. Too short. <laughs> As always. Uh, the, really w the weather really had us uh, convinced for a second that, uh, you know, we we're going to have good weather for a little bit longer, but I guess not. Anyway, if you recall, um, for the last two weeks we've been doing protocols. We started with P2P networks and uh, moved on from there to things like uh, block structures and talking about Ethereum's memory hard computation. Um, now we're going to be talking about EVM and basically how uh, things like the compiler works, uh, slight optimizations. You'll see at a lower level how the assembly um, operates. Um, yeah, and so this is what the, uh, what the outline looks like. We're going to be recapping a little bit on uh, the procedure that the, uh, the EVM takes in order to um, parse through transactions, followed by seeing uh, live demos on you know, what um, you know, executing uh, smart contracts looks like. And then Akash is going to talk a little bit about um, you know, lower level compiler stuff, followed by what the EVM will look like, you know, moving forward. Okay, so this is just general recap stuff. Um, this is stuff we've covered throughout the, uh, the semester. Sorry. Um, and it's basically stuff you should be familiar with. Is there anything on this slide that people, um, are kind of iffy on, I think, um, VR and S, uh, seen here. This is something we haven't really talked about. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's um, just used as uh, a verification mechanism. Um, in addition to that, I want to preface this by talking a little bit about uh, semantics. We've been using things like messages, transactions to refer to uh, what you'd deem as an external transaction call, so an, a, a transaction call originating from uh, like a real life like person as opposed to internally on a contract. And we've been using uh, words like messages to refer to the internal uh, quote unquote transactions that happen on contracts. Um, don't let that confuse you. Uh, you'll see that a lot um, in your own time while you're learning um, that people will use certain words interchangeably. Um, uh, in these slides, we'll use words like gas limit, um, whereas other places you'll see things like start gas, referring to the same things. So again, don't let that confuse you. Um, just try and you know, garner from like contextual knowledge what is going on. Um, and then again, as a reminder, uh, gas um, is used as a mechanism to kind of stop things like infinite loops, um, and that's why it's necessary. Um, and the way it's calculated, if you recall, is that the user is allowed to specify uh, the gas limit, so uh, the total amount of gas they want to spend, in addition to the amount of ether they want to spend per gas. Um, and then the, thing, the EVM goes on from there. Is there anybody confused so far? This is all just recap. OK. And so my question to you folks is, um, what is what dictates how much gas is going to be spent per transaction? Right. So. Is it true that, um, or, or so, you know, what is the, the, the cost per operation? Yeah, it varies based on the complexity um, of the operation itself. And operations are things like, well, they're called opcodes, and they're things like add, subtract, multiply, uh, things like that. Things like jumps as well um, are also relevant. Um, and then if you'll call again, what a transaction actually is at a high level is a mechanism by which to move the state forward. Um, so if you think of a block as a grouping of transactions, uh, that 
grouping acts as an instruction set for informing the network on how the new state, what the new state is going to look like um, by the next block. And in these slides, we're going to define two types of transactions, uh, message calls and uh, contract creation. And so both of those things are externally, are, are originating from externally owned entities, so like, you know, humans. Um, and we're making that distinction right now as opposed to the internal external transactions that we made at the beginning of the semester because that's sort of the, the scope that's more relevant to uh, the EVM. Um, and so the way, so we're going to call the external transactions that we're familiar with, we're going to call them message calls. And then messages are simply just the internal transactions that, that happen within contracts. Anybody confused so far? OK, cool. And so again, uh, things to think about. Can messages um, change the state of the network? Just a simple yes or no. Who thinks yes? So this is messages, not message calls. Who thinks no? OK, yeah. The answer is no. It should just be uh, the message calls that originate from users that change state. OK. So now we're getting more into the nitty gritty of things. Um, and so upon an, uh, initiation of a transaction, um, when we go to the apply state, um, this is basically what happens. These are the checks that need to occur. Um, and basically, things like checking whether uh, the transaction is well formed, uh, whether its fields are its fields match the fields you're expecting, um, whether the signature uh, is valid. Uh, remember that users need to sign off on every transaction that they initiate. Um, whether the sender's nonce matches the transaction nonce. And then after these checks are done, you then have to check whether the user has sent enough gas to be able to launch uh, the contract. right? Um, and so uh, there are a few mechanisms for that there. And then after that, value is transferred. And there are a few semantics again, a few nitty-gritty de nitty -gritty details um, within this that need to be discussed. So for example, um, when a contract uh, fails, when somebody doesn't have enough uh, gas, what happens? Get sent back in. So um, what tends to happen is that the failure still needs to be recorded on the network. <coughs> right? And so what does that mean, that little tidbit? Well, that, that's a, maybe a valid mechanism. But also, the fact is that there needs to be a miner who's able to process the fact that that transaction failed. So what does that tell you there? Yes, exactly. Um, so he needs to be able to uh, receive a reward for the work he puts in um, in verifying that the transaction failed. Uh, so the user uh, doesn't get refunded their gas if they don't specify enough gas. Okay. All right. And there's this check um, for intrinsic val validity. Um, and the way it goes is like this. Um, first of all, uh, it, the transaction is checked for formatting. Um, and so what you'll see is that um, there's a check for a recursive length prefix. Um, again, the transaction is valid, um, both for the signature and the nonce. Um, and then the gas limit is checked. And so all this is called uh, the intrinsic validity. Um, and then the 
the full scope of things is that the intrinsic validity check is only one part of the entire process, right? So we're kind of zooming out here a little bit. So assuming the intrinsic validity check passes, right? Um, the transaction is then passed in, uh, you know, to be executed, um, and it's you know instructions are called, and you know a few things may happen. Uh, one of the things is that the transaction may succeed, right? Which will then generate a resultant state, um, a resultant output, and a few other parameters. And then after which a transaction receipt would be generated, and the user would be um, refunded the rest of the gas was, that was unused. But what are the other options that can occur? So if the transaction doesn't succeed, it fails. fails right. But there's a, there's a distinction here between it failing here and it failing in the intrinsic validity test. Does that make sense? So one is where it fails um, during execution, which is what we're all used to so far, I think. And the other is where it fails during the test. And why do we make those distinctions? Um, because there's two separate parameters. If you get down to looking at um, the bytecode, um, there are two separate parameters that are uh, actually specified. One, which is the transaction fee, and the other, which is the execution fee. And we'll see that in a second. Anybody lost so far? OK. So um, let's try and see an example of execution. OK. Is that big enough? Is that good enough, guys? Yeah. So over here, what we have is a function that just does a simple loop, right? Now, what we can do is we can actually write inline assembly. And this is the first time we're teaching this. And so again, we're going back to Solidity now. And this is something that you can do in any contract. It's generally not recommended just because of things like usability and uh, code clarity. Um, but in instances where you need to save on gas cost, sometimes this is effective. And so we'll see that right now. We have this method, which is just a native loop. Um, uh, we can go ahead and create. Hang on a second. Oh. Oh. Okay. I see. Okay. So. We can look at the details raised over here in a native loop. And we can see that, indeed, there are two different parameters, one for transaction cost that goes through that validity test that I talked about, and one for execution cost. And so the other cool thing that you can do is you can write that loop in assembly. And I'll run you through real quick what happens there. So you first have to. Uh, um, 
dictate basically that you're writing the following code in assembly. After that, what you have to specify is you say you let a variable i um, be equal to 0, and you specify a label called loop. So I guess for anybody who hasn't taken 61C, this may be unfamiliar. Uh, but loop is just um, a segment of code that you can refer back to. Um, and so that's skipped over. And then what you do is you specify add 1 to i. Um, add 1 to underscore r. And underscore r is specified over here as the returned parameter. And then you jump. So jump by is the jump instruction. Um, and you jump back to loop. And this is where that label becomes relevant. And you jump back while something is true. So the way it's done in things like risk 5 is that you branch on a certain condition. And this is similar in that you jump back to a label while a certain condition is true. And what is that condition in this case? And if you need help, just refer back to the native implementation. I is lower than 10. Well, i is lower than 10. And so you specify that i should be lower than 10 with the LT um, mm -hmm. instruction. What questions do you have about this? Yes. Even bigger, OK. OK. Maybe we can. Uh, OK. Great. And so this is the uh, assembly execution cost, 745. If we go back to the uh, non-assembly one, we can see that it's actually a lot bigger. It's like 300 gas uh, more than the assembly cost. Interesting, right? OK, but why doesn't everybody just write their entire contracts in assembly? One of the reasons is we talked about for readability. But actually, if we go ahead and say, hmm. so this is another native implementation of conditionals. Um, if we go and say 5, we'll see here that the execution cost is 270. And then if we launch the same thing here within assembly, we'll see that it's 295. So that's kind of confusing, right? What happened there? Any ideas? So we said assembly is meant to be uh, more efficient in, in its gas use. But clearly, it's not. Um, so what actually happened is that the Solidity compiler uh, optimized in certain ways such that uh, the resulting bytecode um, was more efficient than the inline assembly. So sometimes it doesn't pay off. And you really have to do this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so generally, uh, a, des a common design pattern is that um, for a specific, very granular detail, um, for a very specific method, people will de define like some inline assembly and use that here and there. Um, but for the most part, code will be written in Solidity. Let's see. So the transaction cost here is twenty-one seven five nine. 
explain. It's very similar. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's 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 different actually. Yes. Is there like a known like type of thing? Is there something that you're like, you know, like, oh, this is probably something that just I should write the inline assembly for instead of letting it compile? Hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, a lot of what happens here is due to the design decisions that people make when building compilers um, and the things that they'll be able to do. And uh, Akash will talk a little bit about those design, design decisions. Um, I'm not too familiar with um, what specific design patterns uh, allow the EVM uh, to perform better under inline assembly conditions uh, than optimized solidity, uh, optimized compiled solidity. Um, but that's interesting. I'll try and find some resources on that and post them. And the last thing uh, that's important to know is a returning mechanism um, for inline assembly. And so the way that works is you first define a pointer. Um, so you instantiate some segment in memory. And again, for anyone who's unfamiliar with uh, coding in C, uh, this may be sort of foreign. Um, but memory size uh, puts you at you know, the latest available um, area of memory, and you increment that by one. Um, I'm actually not too sure if that's necessary. But if you don't want to be overriding that, uh, something that may exist there, um, I just added an increment of one. Um, and so now you're, you're at an area, you're at an area of memory that is available to write on. Um, and you'll store at that pointer the value. And then you'll return it. And then I have, a, I have a hex there. Does anybody know what that evaluates to in decimals? Not quite. Yeah, there you go. So it's, uh, it's 2 times 16. There you go. Um, it's 2 times 16, which is 32, um, which is relevant to the size of a, of a storage section um, in the EVM. And again, Akash will talk a little bit more about that implementation. OK. Uh, so basically, what we're saying is return the next uh, storage segment that should contain the value that I want. OK. Any confusion there? Inline assembly, love it or hate it, it exists. You can use it. OK. Now, What's important to note is that um, the EVM state is represented as a tuple of eight parameters. Um, and those are things that you would expect, block state, transaction, message. Um, what's interesting is the program counter, uh, which is a pointer to a specific instruction that is then incremented to move forward in execution. And again, that's a 61C concept. Um, don't worry about that too much. Um, there are uh, parameters that are invariant per contract, so they don't really change. Um, they change more uh, based on the entire block state. Now, let's run through another example, um, but this time we're moving away from sort of like inline assembly and more towards um, uh, opcode uh, parsing and things. Um, and so we have this this. Uh, smart contract, or this, this code in the smart contract. And it's compiled down to EVM assembly. And this is what it looks like. And so each opcode is an operation that either puts something on the stack 
or operates on the top of the stack. So, oh, just some context. This is a name registry contract. And so we're going to be specifying things like IP and, uh, and domain names, right? So in this case, we're going to be specifying uh, domain name you know, 54 with uh, IP 202020 um, and whatnot. And this is sort of the state of the transaction. This is what it's going to look like. Um, and then <coughs> this is what op the opcode execution will look like. Okay. So running through it real quick, um, first things first. Um, we're going to be checking whether we have enough gas to be able to um, follow through with things. And so what we first do is the user has specified a gas limit of 2,000 gas, where the gas price is 1. right? And so OK, we have uh, 2,000 way. Um, and as a default, the EVM uses this calculation, uh, 500 plus 5 times the uh, transaction data length, um, which in this case is the, le the length of the data input, which is 54, and then the IP address 202020, um, which are each two words of 32 bytes, which we talked about um, earlier in the inline assembly. Remember when we talked about the hex value and why that was 32 bytes? Um, and that's because each storage segment um, is, is 32 bytes in the EVM. Um, and so two, two words are, are 64 bytes, right? So the 500 plus, plus 5 times the transaction data length is pretty standard. And so you arrive at a base of 820 gas that you need to spend. right? And if you don't have that much gas, um, the intrinsic check fails before execution begins. OK. So after that, what happens? After that, um, running through the opcodes, you push 0 onto the stack. So um, the most important things to follow would be this stack column, uh, the gas column, and then the, the opcode column. So you push 0 onto the stack. And then immediately afterwards, you see the 0 is on the stack. Um, and you call data load. Um, so you find whatever is on the stack at that location, at that offset. And that value is 54. And flipping back to the code, that's this right here. That's that check, if that makes sense. And so you have the NOP op, um, opcode. Again, if not, right? which turns the 0, since 54 does not exist, the IP 54, uh, the, the domain name 54, does not exist. So it returns a 0. It pushes a 0 onto the stack, which is then knotted. So the opcode takes that top, the top of the stack, sees that it's a 0, puts 1 back on the stack. Right? There's a jump to the next, uh, to the next position specified by the if statement. Um, and here you see um, things like uh, push 32, call data load, push 0, call data load, um, which correspond to push 32, call data load, push 0, call data load. And finally, as store, uh, which makes the assignment from uh, call data load at position 32 into call data load at position 0. Uh, 
What questions do you have on this? OK, great. So a few more examples here. Um, again, we're focusing a little bit on simple parsing. Let me make that bigger for you guys. OK, so we have a contract here, uh, which is just an assignment. right? We're just going to run this. Uh, we're going to define this contract that just does an assignment to 1. It assigns a variable to 1. And uh, if you have SALSI, um, which is the native compiler, you'll, you'll see it'll generate, it'll generate some warnings on compiling. Um, but it'll give us this tag 1, this tag 1 code, uh, which is really the most important code here. Uh, and then th this binary. Um, and within this binary, um, this is the most important uh, stuff, this right here. So if you take that long string of integers apart, this is what you'll be able to ascertain. And then this is actually the instructions um, in human readable form. I guess. And so 0x, um, uh, x, x1 and x0, uh, those just mean uh, push 1 um, and push 0 onto the stack, uh, followed by a few opcodes, um, which basically they uh, duplicate what's on the stack, then swap the two values, the top two values on the stack then store the top one, and then pop the other one. Um, and then this is a run through uh, for your own time. So once again, um, one is pushed onto the stack. Zero is pushed onto the stack. The second item on the stack is duplicated. The top two items are swapped. And does this representation make sense of the stack? The top is on the very um, left of you guys. And then store, what does that do? Sure, we're using which values? But which specific? So there are um, by the first, one? the first and the second one. Exactly, that's important. Um, so by the swap instruction, you have three different values on the stack. But in the end, you only store two of them, and then you pop the last one. Does anybody see a way we can optimize here? So we're we're uh, you know we're up and coming. Uh, compiler des designers, um, this is a clear problem, right? First of all, does anybody see what the problem is? Okay. Right. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so basically, you're doing extra steps. You're putting in work um, to create these extra parameters that you just then throw away at the end. And so what's a more effective way of doing this? It's on the, it's on the slide. Can anyone just describe what's going on? Yeah, you only really need to do the S store. Uh, so you don't need to do the duplication, the swap, and then the pop. OK. So another interesting um, contract is the same thing, but with two assignments. And here, the only difference 
you'll see is that the compiled code, uh, the compiled code is uh, obviously longer. Um, and you'll see that there's the dupe, swap, and store instructions that happen twice, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and again, you'll be able to see that here. Now, the, um, the interesting thing is that the breakdown here in terms of pseudocode is that they're stored right, one right after the other, if that makes sense, on the stack. And actually, generally, um, the EVM chooses to store things, to begin storing uh, data at zero, but that's not the case for every compiler. OK. Um, so the thing is, we can optimize this a little bit more and see how we can store things more efficiently. Um, so storage packing is an important consideration. And that's why you have access not just to int or uint, but int and uint uh, 256s, for example. Um, and so what ends up happening is that, um, let's just go through it real quick. No. <laughs> it's not packing. Right. So you can see that the, the, the Instruction set is a lot more complex here. Um, but essentially, what is happening is that because the storage segment um, is 32 bytes long, um, and we're defining these numbers as being 16 bytes long each, you can store them in the same storage segment, if that makes sense, uh, one after the other. Um, and so what's interesting here, uh, I'm going to save you the hassle of going through uh, the bytecode, um, is that the first store, super expensive, um, it costs 20,000 gas. Uh, but the second store is 5,000 gas. Can anyone venture to guess why that's happening? Go ahead, one of you. Yeah. Uh, is it because in the first one you're uh, paying not just for the actual storing it, but for like the space itself that you're not taking up? Mm -hmm. That has to be carried through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas on future ones, kind of you're paying for the cost of going in and changing what you're storing there. Yeah, essentially. So basically, it's it's uh, you can view it as sort of a reward for reusing space or using space more efficiently. Uh, whereas in normal um, storage cases um, where you didn't specify the amount of bytes, uh, the amount of bits you wanted to take up, so uint 128, if you just specified uint without a number, um, it would cost 20,000 gas uh, for both stores, if that makes sense. And then um, you can also optimize further, um, but I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to pass it on to um, Akash. Uh, just note that the flag there is optimize. OK, so you can go ahead and sign in right now. Cool. Um, 
So how many of you guys have taken any courses in compiler theory or have maybe played around with that kind of stuff? Okay, uh, a few in the room. Uh, well, the good thing is, is this isn't going to be like too in-depth or like too hard to follow. Um, this is going to be like a very introductory um, segment. So I'd like to start with talking more about what really is the EVM. And you know, when we look at any high-level language, um, like Python, for example, Python will often compile down to some other language, like maybe C. And then C eventually compiles down to some kind of assembly. And then eventually, you get uh, binary. Um, along each of those steps, you can think of each language being as some kind of virtual machine. Uh, because essentially, every high-level language you create is an abstract of each uh, machine. right? Uh, and at the very bottom, you have a real machine uh, looking at one, ones and zeros. So that's how you can kind of view uh, high-level languages. They are in themselves uh, virtual machines. And the EVM itself is like uh, another language on top of like binary, essentially. But um, it's, it's a much lower level than, say, Solidity is, right? And this is what everybody tries to write their languages for on Ethereum. So the UVM actually handles all the processing of any transactions within uh, the block that you're working on. Uh, it's also Turing complete, as we saw, but it is bounded by gas. So you know, the total amount of computations you can do is not only limited by the gas provided by the person sending the tra initial transaction, but it's also limited by how much is fit within a block because of the block gas limit. And the EVM also has a stack-based architecture, which we'll kind of dive into. But VMs, uh, I think we should talk about what briefly virtual machines are. And they're basically a way to distribute uh, any kind of program in an architecture, ar architecturally neutral format. Uh, and th this can be very easy um, to interpret or compile. And this is very important because the, EV the Ethereum node is essentially a decentralized client. And everybody needs to run this client. Uh, but you don't make any assumptions about what kind of hardware uh, everybody has on their system. So uh, this uh, makes it very easy to run on multiple machines without having to worry about uh, tailoring for every single one of them. And uh, some VMs, you'll notice, they have different architectures. Uh, there's something called a stack-based architecture. Uh, which if you've done a data structures course, you know that a stack is basically uh, just taking things, uh, inserting them in, uh, popping them right off the top every time. Uh, and uh, there's also the register-based architecture, which uh, if you're more familiar with how a CPU is structured, uh, a CPU is often has like registers in order to, um, it's, it's basically the fastest form of storage you can think of. Uh, under that, you have like L2 caches, L1 caches. Uh, under that, you might have like um, uh, other memory buses that are quicker. And under that, you might have RAM and then disk storage, which is like the slowest. Uh, so this is like the quickest form of like storage you'll like see. And it's very expensive. Uh, there's very few of them on each like CPU. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, one thing I like to point out is that the languages that uh, are used for VMs, uh, they tend to be very minimal. Um, it basically removes all the syntactic sugar. Uh, so if you want to do like list comprehensions in Python, um, that's not what it looks like when you compile down to uh, VM code. Uh, it looks nothing like that. So there's a few things that a VM needs to encompass if uh, it needs to emulate all the operations that are going to be done by a physical CPU. Uh, this includes um, this includes having the data structures that contain the instructions and operands, um, a call stack for function call operations, uh, an instruction pointer pointing to the next instruction to execute. And then there's a virtual CPU, which is an instruction dispatcher. Uh, this will fetch the next instruction. And that'll be adjusted by the instruction pointer you have. It'll decode the operands, and it'll execute every single instruction. So you can think of instructions being stored like uh, with <laughs> memory addresses. And you slowly go through them with like a program counter. And every time you like hit one, you basically uh, execute upon what that's saying. Uh, that's basically what the whole instruction dispatcher is doing. Uh, kind of abstracted, but uh, if you take 61C, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So what's the difference between a stack and a register-based VM? 
So a stack-based architecture uses a last-in, first-out stack uh, to hold any temporary values. And the size of every element within the stack is 256 bits. Uh, and the size of the stack itself has a max size of 1024. So uh, stack size matters because if you, if you know uh, if you know about recursion, you can you can hit like the depth limit uh, in any case if you ever have to do recursion on your uh, programming. Um, yeah, so here's here's like an example. Um, so you have an empty stack. I push uh, 98 onto that stack. Um, afterwards, I push I push 12, and then I push 45. And you can see that there's this like spring at the bottom. Every time I like load something, uh, it's just compressing a little little more, and everything just gets loaded off the top. But I can't really access anything at the at the bottom of the stack. So uh, when I when I add the uh, when I do the plus operand, it takes the top two elements off the stack. We get 57. It puts it back on the top. And when I do another uh, multiplication operand, uh, it'll just take these two numbers, uh, pop them right off the stack, uh, perform the multiplication, and then put it back on the stack. Another type of architecture, which is the register-based architecture. Uh, this is, I'd like to point out, it's not used by the EVM, so um, make sure you don't confuse that. Uh, it's a data structure basically where any of the, all the operands that you do uh, are based on the registers of the CPU itself. It's just simulating basically how a CPU does all its executions. Um, that means I need to specify where all my variables actually are in memory, uh, whereas, I, whereas the stack architecture actually uses pointers to all these things. There's also no push or pop operands, so there's no overhead uh, when using this architecture. Um, the only overhead comes from uh, the external uh, compiling down to other uh, architectures and uh, going through like the full like programming language pipeline. For example, like Python, you got to compile down to like C, and then C you compile down to like assembly, and then you eventually get down to like the bare metal. Um, also, the one thing about uh, register-based VMs is that uh, Oftentimes, the instructions will execute much faster within the, the whole uh, dispatch loop. And this is because the overhead of the stack-based VM has with like the push and pop operations. Also, another, uh, another benefit of this model is that it's much easier to make optimizations. Uh, so like if you have common expressions in your code, the register, the register model uh, can basically calculate it once again. And it's able to store it in another register for future reuse in case the sub expression comes up again. So it's almost like a caching mechanism you can do with sub registers. Whereas with the stack stack based VM, it's a little more limited, right? You saw that everything gets kind of loaded up on the top and then slowly starts coming down, but there's no way to really navigate it really well. Uh, and also the one thing to note is that a stack pointer actually results in shorter instructions, which can be easier to understand. But um, the whole register-based architecture has much longer, uh, longer uh, instructions because you have to explicitly specify the whole uh, memory addresses you're pointing to with, um, those, um, with those types of instructions. This is what kind of it looks like. Um, you can ignore the diagram at the top for now, but this is like one instruction that says, OK, let's add the contents of R1 and R2 and then store it in R3. Pretty simple. A stack-based virtual machine. Um, so what do we know about stack-based vir virtual machines so far? We know that you know, everything gets loaded up at the top. Um, and it's very, it's very much not based on any underlying architecture. It's very abstracted in the sense that you have a stack. Uh, you make no assumptions about the underlying hardware. But with registers, um, how do you make that work for all CPUs, right? CPUs have different architectures. Uh, they have different ways of doing their registers. Um, you need to have a way to kind of uh, make sure that registers like work well on multiple architectures, and that's a tricky that's a tricky business. Uh, if you use a stack virtual, uh, if you use stack based architecture, it's much easier to ignore this abstraction and say, okay, I can just deploy on many more machines, um, but I don't have to worry about uh, the underlying CPUs that they're using. So that makes, uh, that makes things a lot easier. And that's why stuff like Java will, for example, uh, they'll, the Java VM will be a stack-based machine. And it runs on, say, it run, well, it runs on Android, for example. Uh, it also runs on several other devices, like uh, desktop computers and, and the likes of those servers. 
uh, all of which can have like different architectures and still work. But uh, you don't really have to worry as much about uh, the different architectures because it is a stack-based machine. But the only thing is that stack machines are not optimized for uh, CPUs in general. Uh, and that's like tricky. You can think of like, you know, with a register, we, we saw that you can do um, some types of caching. Like you can look at expressions that you've made in the past and uh, essentially leverage those um, later on as like caching mechanisms. But with stack, there's no way to really like look at that and say, uh, you know, where's the variable that I've used before and store it again, unless you use some other uh, caching mechanism at a different memory layer, which might not be within uh, the register layer, which is the fastest layer, it might be in the L1 or L2 caches instead of the CPU. So we talked about the stack architecture, but I think what's next that we need to talk about is the storage aspect of the EVM. And the EVM has memory, and this is where all items are stored as word address byte arrays. This memory is volatile, so it's not permanent. And it also has a key value storage mechanism within the EVM. So one thing to note that this is interesting, uh, the, this is the only VM that uses uh, an associative array or a dictionary for its address space. Usually this is not the case. Um, can anybody guess why we do this for storage? Nick kind of like touched on it a little earlier as to why we, as to why the uh, Ethereum kind of does this for storage. Okay, uh, well, one reason why you might uh, do like a key value store for storage is um, so that you have easy lookup access to um, your your variables. Uh, so. If you have like your permanent storage for your smart contracts, um, you're thinking of the variables at the top of the contract, the ones that are gonna be stored for every instance on the blockchain. You're not thinking about the instance variables within the functions, right? Um, so if you have an associative array for that, it's, it's, very, it's much easier to kind of like look up where those variables are. So the EVM also stores like program code in a separate virtual ROM. Uh, this is read-only memory, so you can't really like tamper with it, I guess, um, unless you really like break into the EVM. You could try to find ways to do it, but uh, this is for kind of like abstraction reasons. So you might be wondering why does the EVM use 256-bit words, right? Most of the stuff that we've seen often uses 32-bit or 64-bit, um, and one of the reasons that they did this was uh, crypto primitives are often uh, giving you 256-bit outputs, uh, like SHA-256. Uh, the public key in Ethereum is 256-bit uh, uint. Uh, private key also uses um, uh, this elliptic curve function um, with two 256-bit uh, uints. Uh, has to do with the RNS that you often see in a transaction as well. Um, also, 160-bit account addresses will fit into this. And uh, there are 256-bit um, SMID uh, data set, uh, instruction set architectures uh, on modern CPUs these days. So you can do, um, you can do some vectorization techniques and uh, basically have uh, single instruction, multiple data, uh, data level parallelism. So uh, there, there, are some catches, there are some catches to this though. Uh, they actually realized later on that this, uh, this actually did not help the EVM as well as it should have. So they are like, uh, they are looking into com changing the word size down to 64-bit again, uh, or 32-bit, uh, because this is what real hardware does. And this can increase speed because, you know, the closer you are to metal, the less translations you have to do to like communicate with the real metal. And uh, if you don't know what SM SIMD parallelism is, because um, 61C, or it's been a while since 61C. Um, it's basically it's pretty similar to MapReduce, um, except like you can think of you can think of like having uh, like a CPU register, or sorry, a CPU and multiple like data register, like uh, and a CPU can just apply multiple um, 
operations to like multiple data registers at once. It's kind of just like uh, parallelism. And this is kind of like a diagram of what uh, the EBM uh, looks like storage-wise. So you have your code in a ROM, uh, you have um, you have your storage in RAM, and this is non-volatile. So this stuff doesn't uh, this stuff doesn't really change. But then you have the stack, you have your args, you have your memory, and uh, this is this is all volatile. This is often changing. And actually, the call data load is just uh, that is just an opcode to get um, basically the input data of your function uh, for like the current environment you're in. So that's why it's there. EBM also is a very security-oriented VM, and I think it's good to know like some of the security um, considerations that went into this. Uh, so some of the restrictions that we have are that all the computational steps that you do ne need to be paid for upfront uh, so that you prevent any kind of denial of service attacks, right? You don't want anybody trying to submit a, a, uh, some kind of loop that starts to spam the whole network um, without paying upfront. Also, um, Programs can only interact with each other by transmitting a single arbitrary length byte array. They don't have access to each other's state. So this is important because you don't want people to be able to uh, just change other people's state. You want uh, someone else's state to accept that their state should be changed. Uh, and this is all kind of abstracted away underneath protocol code. Uh, and sure, you might you might think like somebody could try to break consensus this way, but if you're breaking consensus, then things don't work out. So just assume that this is secured by uh, crypto economics. <coughs> also, program execution is sandbox for the EVM, so you can modify only your internal state and the internal state of all the EVM programs you have, but you cannot touch like anything else like outside of that. Otherwise, you could totally like find ways to, to do malware attacks on people's uh, systems running the EVM. Also, program execution is fully deterministic, and it produces identical state transitions for any conforming implementation of the Ethereum client, right? And this is very important for consensus. You need some kind of spec that defines what your protocol should be, um, and they all need to comply with this protocol so that everybody can agree on something. So we saw that you know to go from Solidity to bytecode, all you need to do is run Sol C. Uh, but what really happens there? So you can kind of break this down into five steps. Uh, you have parsing of that code. You then have syntax checking. You have type checking. You do some static analysis. And then you do some code generation. So let's walk through some of those steps. So parsing is simple. All you do is you take your Solidity source code and it's a stream of characters. And what you want to do is you then want to construct, um, for all the operations in your source code, you want to construct a abstract syntax tree. So here, I have this line of code, a equals 1 plus 3. All I do is I construct a, I construct a tree from the bottom up. Uh, so I have a as the identifier, have an assignment expression um, equals, and I have my literals here. Um, and What's being applied to these is the plus operator. And what's being applied to A and this whole um, like new node that we could create is, uh, is the equals operator, the assignment operator. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's pretty similar to how, you can think of it almost like registers, actually, and how they like execute. And then you have the lexer and scanner, which is then used to build this tree. So it takes all the file characters uh, for the source code. It turns it into a stream of discrete tokens. Uh, so you can look here, like if I have a contract and it's called test, uh, I can fetch like um, that it's contract. I can see that the name is test. I can see that there's a left bracket. There is a uint uh, with some ID uh, paid. Um, and then there's an equals, and there's a zero, and there's an end of statement, which is like a semicolon. And then we so on, right? So you can have like a function with a left parentheses, a right parentheses. You basically just parse it into tokens. And once you take this um, stream of tokens, you run it through something called a recursive descent parser. Uh, 
which then will see what rules are applied to our tokens for syntax checking. So for example, like what defines a valid while loop in Solidity? Uh, this is where you use uh, something like a recursive descent parser. You have to keep checking like um, you have to keep checking that your nested code within your nested code is going to uh, be validly written code. Um, and that's what the syntax checker does for you. Type checking is basically, it's pretty simple. All you do is you go through the um, abstract syntax tree notes from the bottom and you traverse upward. You check, you check for um, uints, you check for any strings, you look for constructors, you look for loops. And basically, you label you basically label all your nodes, and if you can't find like a correct label for them, type checking fails. There's also the static analyzer, um, which will basically just bring up any issues or warnings uh, for your code. So it might check that your Solidity uh, code is a library, uh, which is like the first thing it does if you look at the uh, C++ implementation of the Solidity compiler. Uh, it'll look for like payable functions. Um, it might even look for anything that's deprecated, and it'll pop up any warnings that you might see. And if you come up and if you compile with Sol C, uh, as Nick showed, you pretty much get this uh, EVM bytecode. So, what's some problems with Sol C? Uh, some problems that have been like mentioned by a lot of the Ethereum community is that it's very difficult to audit uh, contracts with this. You know, does, does any of the functions return what they're supposed to? Uh, is the compiler even creating the bytecode according to the source code? Also, uh, compiler helpers and optimizations in Solidity are a little too complex. Um, so if I want to do any kinds of like uh, intrinsics or I want to try to optimize for um, source code in general, like through memory packing or other methods uh, that have been discovered, uh, it's just been very difficult to do within Sol C. And also, uh, porting Solidity to other VMs has been pretty tricky. But more specifically, creating any kind of domain-specific languages on top of that uh, is a problem because you can't really trust Solidity as a base for like creating more domain-specific languages. And by domain-specific language, I don't mean uh, like a general computing language, like what most languages are. Uh, I mean more like some language that might be dedicated solely to um, Maybe not in the case of Solidity, but uh, maybe dedicate the type safety or uh, specifically to data science or concurrency or, f or whatever you want to do. But this is kind of what the pipeline is, and we kind of went over it. Uh, a compiler has a front end, which has a parser, uh, it analyzes, and then it generates an intermediate representation of the program. It has a middle end where you apply optimizations and uh, that's on the intermediate representation of the program that you have. And then afterwards, uh, the back end will generate uh, the bytecode for the target machine, and you can do even more optimizations. This is how something like GCC or LLVM uh, might come up with some output for you. And I'll skip over this, but uh, this is actually how Sol C does it. So Sol C has a front end, it parses Solidity and analyzes, it generates EVM bytecode. And then all it does is, is it optimizes that EVM bytecode on the back end, but there is no like middle end. There's, no, there's nothing that's like trying to optimize for Solidity, which is a little problematic. Uh, you usually see this in other languages that um, they'll try to like, you know, fix any like, uh, egregious uh, optimizations uh, they could like, go over. Um, and it kind of like went over memory packing, for example. Uh, Solidity does that, but there's several other ones out there that could be done that are not being done. And uh, this is an interesting graph. This kind of shows you like what's the difference between uh, a lot of the uh, implementations out there. Um, so there's EVM, there's Parity's implementation, there's ETHVM, there's EVM to WASM, which is uh, going to be the next version of the EVM, I believe. And um, there's EVM just in time, which is currently not secure, but very, very fast, as you can see. And then there's native C++, which is very close to the bare metal. And uh, if you're wondering like who's responsible for this, this is because of the Ethereum wizard, Dr. Greg Colvin. <laughs> and uh, he, he's, he's, he's a pretty smart guy based on the talks I've seen. So. Um, so EVM interpreters are pretty slow um, in general, like as we can see here. Um, and the reason why is because interpreters have a lot of overhead. You know, if you go to the benchmarks game, you see like 
Python versus C++, you'll see like there's a huge difference in speed. Uh, also, 256-bit registers often slow us down. You know, as we as we know, like real hardware does have 32-bit and 64-bit registers, and not having to do that translation really saves a lot of time. Uh, also, um, if you want to try to leverage SIMD intrinsics on specific processors, uh, so if you want to like uh, vectorize specific uh, data types when you're writing code, um, or and if you want the compiler to do that automatically for you, uh, that's very difficult on a compiler like this that's designed to be run on multiple machines. So it's often not done. Also, uh, EVM does not have any hierarchically structured control flow. Uh, what that means is like this makes uh, your static analysis pretty difficult because any of your control flow paths, as in like where your functions are going to be going to in terms of like, okay, uh, I don't know what my program is really going to do uh, when I compile it until I go through it. And that's the problem with Ethereum, right? But uh, in many languages, there's often some kind of um, deterministic structured control flow. But with the EVM, uh, this is not the case. And there can be several different control flow paths that you don't know about. And this is a problem because you don't know uh, where the next call function call might go uh, pathwise at scale. <laughs> you might be wondering, based on the chart you saw, why is just in time compiling so quick uh, compared to all the other ones? It like absolutely crushes like everything, and it's the closest that we've seen to like native C++. And the reason why is because a just in time compiler will basically start and compile the code on the fly. Um, and it'll know how to make any kind of optimizations that you want as you execute code. Um, so, for example, like you can make uh, you can make optimizations such as uh, if you see like some kind of inline function that's being used frequently, um, the compiler can optimize for that and know that oh you're using this very frequently. Um, let's make it easier for you to access. But also the problem with this is that securing is difficult. Um, how do you how do you do on the fly compilation and this whole distributed system when uh, compiling is often done uh, upfront at deployment time? Like it's done that way for a reason, right? So you can't really have people uh, like try to do um, EVM uh, just in time uh, because whenever somebody like submits on the blockchain, they're often submitting they're submitting the bytecode so that everybody can uh, also run it. For consensus reasons. Also, didn't it really slow the startup time for just in time compilers? Wouldn't that get lost? Hmm. Good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know much about that actually. I don't know about startup time for just in time compilers. That's uh, that's an interesting point though. So, what's the future of EVM? And I'll wrap this up because I know we're running out of time. Uh, so the idea. So EVM 2.0. Uh, they were thinking about doing uh, WebAssembly. Um, which has some benefits that I can cover, but uh, also they had some suggestions to extend with more opcodes, uh, forbid any kind of unconstrained jumps. Um, so if you have code that's more straight lined, where you don't start jumping around all over the place, um, it's going to be a lot faster than having to take random jumps uh, across different uh, memory, memory boundaries in your code. Uh, so techniques like loop unrolling can also help with this, where like everything is kind of serialized in a loop in front of you, rather than jumping between different memory addresses uh, when code gets executed. Also, EBM 2.0 is going to provide opcodes for subroutines, which is, uh, I think, pretty standard in other like virtual machines. Uh, these are just basically like functions within like, uh, I guess, sequences of program instructions. Yeah, functions within a compiler. And then uh, there's also going to be opcodes that will help uh, optimize native scalar and SIMD vector types. So this will make it easy to do data level parallelism with any like larger computations on arrays, especially. And uh, this will also validate control flow. So um, this is good for like uh, static analysis and uh, verifying any type safety of the program that you're dealing with. And yeah, uh, WebAssembly, um, quicker parsing times. It's not restricted to JavaScript for web. It's sandbox for security. Uh, it's got a lot of great features. I suggest you read the um, design documents on it if you're interested in this stuff. 
Um, it's very detailed. Uh, it's also going to be somewhat transformative to the web, hopefully. Um, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, we'll see. But the way, the way I see it is like a lot of people are writing JavaScript these days, and JavaScript has like all these different versions. And this will definitely make things more convenient because um, you know, people can just compile down, write whatever JavaScript version they want, compile down to WebAssembly, and the whole web understands it. But that's not the case with the web today. Everybody's having to transpile over to JavaScript uh, specifically to work with all browsers. So yeah, I'll see you next time. We're going to talk about uh, scaling. So that'll include like sharding, Casper, uh, state channels, lightning, plasma, some interesting stuff. <laughs>